Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the OnSemi third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising that your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the call over to Parag Agarwal, Vice President of Investor Relations and Corporate Development. Please go ahead. Thank you, Tanya. Good morning, and thank you for joining on Sami's third quarter 2024 quarterly results conference call. I am joined today by Hassan El Khori, our President and CEO, and Thad Trent, our CFO. This call is being webcast on the Investor Relations section of our website at www.onsemi.com. A replay of this webcast, along with our 2024 third quarter's earnings release, will be available on our website approximately one hour following this conference call, and the recorded webcast will be available for approximately 30 days following this conference call. Additional information is posted on the Investor Relations section of our website. Our earnings release and this presentation include certain non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures and a discussion of certain limitations when using non-GAAP financial measures are included in our earnings release, which is posted separately on our website in the Investor Relations section. During the course of this conference call, we may make projections or other forward-looking statements regarding future events or the future financial performance of the company. We wish to caution that such statements are subject to risk and uncertainties that could cause actual events or results to differ materially from projections. Important factors that can affect our business, including factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from our forward-looking statements are described in our most recent Form 10-K, Form 10-Qs, and other filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and in our earnings release for the third quarter of 2024. Our estimate or other forward-looking statements might change, and the company assumes no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results, change assumptions, or other events that may occur except as required by law. Now, let me turn it over to Hassan. Hassan? Thank you, Parag. Good morning, and thanks to everyone for joining us on the call. Our third quarter results once again demonstrated the structural changes we have made to the business with revenue, gross margin, and earnings per share all above the midpoint of our guidance. With a sharp focus on execution and operational excellence, we have delivered on our commitments amid continued softness in the market. Over the last several quarters, we've talked about an L-shaped recovery, and as expected, the demand environment remains muted with ongoing inventory digestion and slow end demand. Our outlook for all markets remains unchanged as uncertainty persists among our customers. Automotive continues to be soft with slowing EV sell-through. Industrial, which slowed first, has not broadly recovered except for pockets in utility-scale solar and aerospace and defense. Regionally, China and Japan are recovering with strength in XEVs, but North America and Europe remain soft in both automotive and industrial. Despite the current slowdown, we are confident in our strategy. We are in the markets that matter, the fastest growing segments of the automotive, industrial, and AI data center that will continue to outpace the growth of the semiconductor market overall, and we are committed to delivering value to our customers through product and system level innovation. The breadth and performance of our portfolio continues to be a differentiator, enabling us to optimize energy efficiency for our customers' applications as a one-stop source for intelligent power and sensing solutions. In Q3, our silicon carbide revenue increased sequentially, driven by utility-scale solar and share gains in China BEVs. Outside of China, although programs went into production, the sell-through is expected to be below our forecasts for the second half of this year. We will continue to cautiously monitor end demand to avoid building inventory on our customers' shelves that would impact 2025. For the full year 2024, we don't expect meaningful market growth 
as third-party reports would suggest. We expect our silicon carbide revenue to be in the low to mid-single digit growth over 2023. On the technology development front, we have qualified our 200 millimeter M3 silicon carbide ahead of schedule. Our eight inch wafers are running in the fab at 350 micron thickness and yields are equivalent to those on our six inch wafers. We are sampling from both internal and external sources for substrates. We remain very deliberate with our silicon carbide strategy. We are focused on vertically integrating up where our advanced packaging solutions deliver system optimization for our customers. We will participate where we are differentiated and where our margin levels match the value we provide to our customers. In automotive, China is driving the pace of innovation and leading the transition to 800 volt architectures where silicon carbide is critical to enabling faster charging, extended range, and better energy efficiency in vehicles. Our 1200 volt M3E silicon carbide is well positioned to be used in China's extended range electric vehicles as they transition to 800 volt architectures where a small internal combustion engine can recharge the battery. We expect to exit the year with approximately 50% of China's BEF silicon carbide market share based on our design win activity as we continue to broaden our penetration with the top OEMs. In industrial, we lead the market with our silicon carbide portfolio. Our industrial sick customer count over the last four quarters increased 17% as compared to the previous four quarters. Beyond silicon carbide, we have been investing in the performance of our power portfolio to address emerging trends in renewable energy. Global solar installations are expected to reach 500, 552 gigawatts in 2024 versus 433 gigawatts in 2023 at a 27% year-on-year increase, and global energy storage system installation are expected to reach 178 gigawatts with a year-over-year -year increase of 69%. We continue to gain momentum in these markets based on the leading performance and power density realized using our high-density F5 BP IGBT and hybrid SIC and IGBT modules we announced in the quarter. We are designed in with the four of the top five utility scale manufacturers with our latest generation of field stop seven modules, delivering application optimized solutions that increase power density and efficiency with voltages ranging from 650 to 1200 volts. Our intelligent sensing business grew 11% quarter over quarter with strength in ADAS and industrial imaging across a range of applications such as machine vision, robotics, and scanning. We are proliferating our portfolio to access new industrial applications, enabling our customers to select and optimize the feature set for their needs. Over the last year, we have released 10 new image sensors across four product families, and we are getting traction in applications that include medical imaging, biometrics, autonomous mobile robots, and automated guided vehicles, to name a few. Our five and eight megapixel Hyperlux LP image sensors, for example, are an excellent, an excellent choice for entry-level 4K video surveillance camera with industry-leading low power, low light sensitivity, and wake on motion. In 2025, we plan to introduce a new family or image sensors to further broaden our offering. We've also received positive feedback from our customers and channel partners on the SWIR technology we acquired last quarter. This differentiated technology enables us to expand our industrial offering into agriculture, medical imaging, inspection, and aerospace and defense applications. In data centers, we have a tremendous opportunity as we expect the power delivery market for enterprise cloud and AI servers to double from $2.2 billion in 2024 to $4.4 billion by 2028. As power requirements in racks continue to scale from 40 kilowatts to 120 kilowatts, we expect our addressable content per rack to continue to increase. We have invested in this space through the downturn, delivering a silicon and silicon carbide portfolio capable of meeting the ever-increasing demands of AI data centers across the entire power tree. We have released multi-phase controllers, which combine with our industry-leading smart power stages to deliver full vCore solutions to power NVIDIA and ARM-based CPUs. 
We continue to gain traction with our T10 power trench MOSFETs, E-Fuse point of load, and V-Core products, securing design wins with three of the top four hyperscalers in North America, which are expected to contribute to revenue in 2025. We have also been investing to broaden our portfolio of analog mixed signal products, and we look forward to Electronica next month when we plan to share more detail about our new portfolio. Let me now turn it over to Thad to give you more details on our results. <clears throat> Thanks, Sasan. Our team's focus on execution and operational excellence in the face of ongoing market challenges delivered another quarter for revenue, gross margin, and earnings per share were above the midpoint of our guidance. Q3 free cash flow increased 41% sequentially as we achieved our CapEx target ahead of schedule with our capacity expansion largely behind us. The consistency of our results demonstrate the resilience we have built in our business model. We remain focused on high growth megatrends, optimizing our manufacturing footprint, and we're investing to lead the market where we can add value for our customers. These structural improvements continue to deliver better results than the company was able to achieve in prior downturns. If we dive into revenue for the third quarter, we saw broad-based softness offset by silicon carbide growth, which resulted in a 2% sequential increase to $1.76 billion. As Asan mentioned, inventory digestion persists across our business groups in automotive and industrial, which accounted for 79% of our revenue. Automotive revenue was $951 million, which increased 5% sequentially, driven by silicon carbide and ADAS image sensors. We continue to see softness and in-demand, but content gains driven by silicon carbide in China are driving our growth in this market. As compared to the third quarter of 2023, automotive revenue was down 18%. Revenue for industrial was $440 million, down 6% sequentially and 29% year over year. We saw pockets of growth in utility scale solar and our aerospace and defense business, while the traditional industrial remained relatively stable in the third quarter. We have re re recently received trusted foundry accreditation at our Eastville fab, which will allow us to expand our aerospace and defense business. Looking at the split between the business units, revenue for the Power Solutions Group, or PSG, was $829 million, a decrease of 1% quarter over quarter and 23% year over year. Revenue for the Analog and Mixed Signal Group, or AMG, was $654 million, an increase of 1% quarter over quarter and a decrease of 16% year over year. Revenue for the Intelligent, Intelligent Sensing Group, or ISG, was $279 million, an 11% increase quarter over quarter, driven by ADAS. ISG revenue decreased 15% over the same quarter last year. <clears throat> GAAP gross margin was 45.4%, and non-GAAP gross margin was 45.5%, compared to 45.3% in Q2 and 47.3% in the quarter a year ago. We have maintained our gross margin a bit above the mid 40% and improved it by 20 basis points over Q2 with utilization remaining flat at 65%. As a reminder, in prior downturns, our gross margin had been around 30% at these utilization levels. As we continue to drive efficiencies across the company through our FabRite strategies, we are well positioned to benefit from gross margin expansion once the market begins to recover. As I mentioned earlier, our investments in capacity expansion are largely behind us. We now expect our capital intensity target to be in the mid-single-digit percentage range for 2025 and beyond as compared to a previous target of 11%. This is the result of the excellent work our manufacturing teams have done to improve our efficiencies across our network. This new CapEx target includes the brownfield investments in the Czech Republic we anticipate making over a multi-year period. Lowering our capital intensity will increase free cash flow margin towards our targeted 25 to 30%. We also remain committed to our long-term target of returning 50% of free cash flow to shareholders. Over the last 12 months, we have returned 75% of free cash flow with $200 million in share buybacks in the third quarter. 
since initiating, initiating our $3 billion share repurchase program in February of 2023, we have returned just over $1 billion to our shareholders. Now let me give, me some, give you some numbers for your models. GAAP operating expenses for the third quarter were $354 million as compared to $344 million in the third quarter of 2023. Non-GAAP operating expenses were $304 million compared to $322 million in the quarter a year ago. Non-GAAP operating expenses were lower than the midpoint of our guidance due to active cost control and lower, lower variable compensation. GAAP operating margin for the quarter was 25.3% and non-GAAP operating margin was 28.2%. Our GAAP tax rate was 11.5% and non-GAAP tax rate was 16%. Diluted GAAP earnings per share for the second quarter was 93 cents as compared to $1.29 in the quarter a year ago. Non-GAAP earnings per share was 99 cents as compared to $1.39 in Q3 of 20, 2023. And GAAP diluted share count was 432 million shares and our non-GAAP diluted share count was 428 million shares. Turning to the balance sheet, cash and short-term investments was $2.8 billion with total liquidity of $3.9 billion, including $1.1 billion undrawn on our revolver. Cash from operations was $466 million and free cash flow increased 41% sequentially to $294 million, representing 17% of revenue. Capital expenditures during Q3 were $172 million, which equates to a capital intensity of 10%. Inventory increased by $18 million sequentially and decreased by one, days, one day to 213 days. This includes 100 days of bridge inventory to support fab transitions and the silicon carbide ramp. Excluding these strategic bills, our base inventory decreased sequentially by $32 million or four days to 113 days, which continues to be within our target range of 100 to 120 days. Our mass market customer count grew 15% year over year in the third quarter, as we have been increasing inventory in the distribution channel to support this growth. Distribution weeks of inventory were 9.7 versus 8.9 weeks in Q2, and we expect distribution inventory to increase to 10 weeks plus or minus in Q4 as we continue to seed this long tail of high margin customers. <clears throat> Looking forward, let me give you some key elements of our non-GAAP guidance for the fourth quarter. Given the current macro environment and our demand visibility, we anticipate Q4 revenue will be in the range of $1.71 billion to $1.81 billion. We expect non-GAAP gross margin to be between 44 and 46% with flat to slightly down utilization. This includes share-based compensation of $7 million. We expect non-GAAP operating expenses of $300 million to $315 million including share-based compensation of $31 million. We anticipate our non-GAAP other income to be a net benefit of $12 million with our interest income exceeding interest expense. We expect our non-GAAP tax rate to be approximately 16% and our non-GAAP diluted share count ex is expected to be approximately 427 million shares. This results in non-GAAP earnings per share to be in the range of 92 cents to a dollar and four cents. We expect capital expenditures in the range of 130 to $170 million. And as a reminder, today's press release contains a, a table detailing our GAAP and non-GAAP guidance. While we are cautious about the near-term macro, we remain committed to our long-term strategy. We've remained disciplined and continue to invest for the future, both in new generations of intelligent power and sensing products and to position the company to scale efficiently for a market recovery. To wrap up, we are investing in the fastest growing segments of the industry as the world shifts towards renewable energy, electrification, automation, and AI. The breadth and performance of our portfolio address the growing need for energy efficiency and the proliferation of sensor-driven ecosystems. Our employees continue to be the foundation of the resiliency of OnSemi 
and I want to acknowledge the hard work of our, of our teams across the globe as we remain committed to unlocking shareholder value. With that, I'd like to turn the call back over to Tanya to open the call for Q&A. Certainly. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And one moment for our first question. Our first question will come from Ross Seymour of Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Thanks for letting me ask a question. I, I guess the first one is on the silicon carbide business. I, I know it's not the hugest part of your total revenues, but strategically it's incredibly important. When, Hassan, you talked about that being up low to mid single digits, do you believe that there is just evidence of a cyclical weakness, or has something started to secularly change as people have gotten a little more concerned on not only the pace of EV growth, but competition coming in and commoditization and those sorts of dynamics? Yeah, right. I, we uh, we do still believe it's cyclical. Therefore, that's why I made the comment that the long-term uh, uh, trend for electrification and EV in general has not changed. Uh, and very important to note, uh, the designs or the models that we expected to ramp uh, did go into production. They just didn't ramp to uh, uh, the level that we expected, which says that it's a short-term demand, but back to the lumpiness of EV adoption and not a change in in strategy or a mega trend type otherwise you know those models would have been canceled or or not even launched so customers did launch the sell through as we expected and you saw during the quarter is not coming as expected from the OEMs and therefore we're uh, uh, cautiously monitoring uh, Q4 for that but nothing changes in our long term nothing changes in the strategic importance of SIC and the importance of plays in EVs as EVs in China, followed by uh, U.S. and uh, Europe, will continue to uh, to be adopted. Thanks for that. And I guess for my follow-up, one for that on the gross margin side of things, has anything changed in your ability to hold the 45%? Obviously, in your quarter and guide, it didn't. But as you look forward, you said utilization is going to be flat to down on one hand. Uh, you also talked about demand continuing to be weak. But the CapEx is also coming down. So lots of moving parts, it seems. Uh, is the net conclusion anything different than what you've said before on both the 45% floor and the 53% peak? No, I, I think if you look at where our utilization is today, you know, it's 65% plus or minus. You know, that's, that's where historically we've been at a low point. Um, and holding that mid-40% uh, margin has, has been kind of a, a major initiative for us. As we look forward, you know, you, you obviously get some mix uh, in, in Q4, which why our guidance is, is slightly lower. But um, no, as we look forward, you know, we're optimizing that manufacturing footprint. We're focused on fab right. We're continuing to take cost out. Um, so, you know, at these levels, we can hold. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will come from Vivek Arya of Bank of America Securities. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is, if we look forward, uh, Q1 is when you tend to have uh, some of these uh, pricing discussions with your uh, customers. Um, and um, I imagine at some point, um, right, some of the benefits of uh, long-term supply agreements um, tail off. So, Hassan, I'm curious, what's kind of your early preview on how these uh, pricing discussions will uh, take place? just how we should think about uh, Q1 seasonality, uh, given all the comments you made about the macro environment. Yeah, look, we don't, we don't guide uh, two quarters out, but let me give you kind of our, our uh, strategy and how we approach this. Because first off, the industry is not going back to, in my view, a Q1 kind of cliff. Uh, negotiations happen throughout, ramps happen you know, any quarter, and new design wins, which is where you set pricing, happen during any quarter. So I don't believe uh, uh, a Q1, as you have always uh, uh, seen it historically, is kind of a pricing cliff. Having said that, our approach, and we've been very consistent with that since, we, uh, uh, since I started four years ago, is we're going to price on value. Uh, we're not going to chase after the market. We actually went, uh, walked away from a lot of that business. Uh, we will continue to price on value, and we will continue to pursue opportunities where we provide value, which means that as soon as an opportunity is a 
a pricing discussion, meaning the lowest price wins, that is not strategically a business we want to uh, uh, win in, which means our focus on getting to that 53% uh, uh, margin model that Thad uh, reiterated uh, in, the, in the prior comment is a strategic focus for us, and we will continue to create products that differentiate, add value to the customer, and therefore hold the margin and not get into this quarterly or even annual price negotiation levels. Thank you. And for my um, follow-up, um, if the macro environment is softer, why is ON deciding to expand um, distribution inventory? I thought the, the prior thinking was that you would keep inventory, I think, around nine weeks or, or below nine weeks, but it is going up in Q3, and the assumption is that it goes up in uh, Q4. So what's the uh, thinking and, and the trend behind that, and can that create an overhang as we go into the first half of next year? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. So a few quarters ago, we mentioned that we're going to start seeding uh, uh, the DC inventory, which we really have starved over the last few years, servicing the high volume uh, uh, customers or uh, a lot of the key customers for us. And the strategy behind that is to expand the mass market uh, uh, customers and expand the mass market in general that we have starved. And that's typically a high margin business. So what we've done two quarters ago is we started putting very strategic products into the channel and the customer count, the mass market customer count has been very favorable. Therefore, our strategy has really been executed properly and, and yielded the results we wanted, which is mass market, higher customer count, and higher margin mix into that channel. So we will continue to do that. What we monitor is, of course, the FIFO level meaning products that we put in, are they POSing out? Uh, and over how many quarters are they POSing out? Which means we're not building inventory in the uh, DST that just stays there and creates that overhang. So we have a very tight process. We started that strategy with the intent of growing that mass market customers. We have done that, and therefore we have a pretty good recipe to be able to do that while not building the overhang that typically you would see in uh, uh, distribution inventory in a slow uh, market environment. Yeah, and Vivek, the, uh, the mass market customer count has been up 15% year over year, so you can see that the uh, strategy of moving that inventory in there is working. Um, for that customer base, you just need inventory on the DISTI shelves. Um, our DISTIs would still take more inventory than we're, we're, what we're willing to ship them, but we are controlling it uh, tightly. Thank you. And our next question will come from Tashia Hari of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for taking the question. Um, Hassan, I guess my first question is on the, the silicon carbide business. And I'm curious, you know, what your, you know, application mix or customer mix looks like today and going into 2025 you know, versus what it looked like a year ago. I think a year ago, you know, it was something like 80% auto, 20% industrial. Um, and then within auto, you were very over-indexed to one North American customer. Um, I think on prior calls, you had talked about, you know, that mix broadening out to, you know, companies in Europe and customers in China, particularly on the automotive side. So I'm curious what that looks like today, and more importantly, um, how it broadens out into, into 25. Sure. Uh, so the mix overall between auto and industrial is about the same. You can think about 80-20, you know, give or take on uh, uh, depending on the quarter and the ramps that we uh, uh, talked about. And uh, that we don't expect that to change because, look, the industrial softness and the automotive uh, softness both kind of happened, which means there's not a over strength in one market or over uh, uh, softness in the other to change that mix. In, uh, on a quarter on quarter or even a year on year. So we expect that to be the same, about 80-20, which matches the total, the TAM of that market. Uh, so we're indexed to, to the market uh, mix as, as it stands. As far as diversification, uh, yes, you know, I talked about ramps in uh, uh, China EV, which is really the, uh, the strength that we've seen in uh, silicon carbide. We've uh, uh, seen share gains in uh, key customers. Uh, already, you know, we always talked about penetration and gaining share within those accounts. That's been happening. Uh, I talked about Europe ramping in the second half. That also did happen. 
the difference is the end volume is not what we expected. So from uh, share gains, from design wins uh, that are actually going to production, everything is happening on schedule and we're in these sockets. Uh, but the end uh, uh, units is not where we expect it to be, which goes back to you know, Ross's question earlier. When the market does recover and that volume goes up again, we're going to see that benefit on the upside because we're already all in these sockets and it's qualified. So that's what we have to look forward to, and that's what we're staging for. Got it. Th thank you. And then as my follow-up on capital intensity, and maybe this one's for, for Thad, so medium to long term, your, your target is now mid-single digits, uh, percentage of revenue uh, versus 11%, which I think is a pretty big change. Um, you talked about, you know, some of the reasons and, you know, you know, capacity expansion being behind you and you guys being able to identify some productivity gains. But has there been any changes in how you think about, you know, for example, in SIC internal substates, substrates versus external, uh, silicon broadly, you know, foundry versus internal, whether it be wafer processing or packaging and test? Any structural changes to how you think about your footprint? Yeah, and, and especially just to be clear, the uh, the five percent is is now our new long term target, right? So we've achieved um, our target. Our original target was eleven percent. We achieved that, um, and you know we talked about that last quarter coming down below. You know the fact is our our manufacturing footprint is just getting optimized here, right? Um, so now we've moved into a, a phase where we're still going to invest in the Czech Republic. But a lot of this now starts to become maintenance capital on the footprint that we have um, as we're, we continue to focus on, on the fab right strategy. So I wouldn't say there's a, a structural change here as much as the performance has exceeded our expectations. Yeah, on the silicon carbide, you know, we uh, obviously we're going to keep expecting the growth on uh, silicon carbide as the market kind of recovers and goes on the uptick, as I mentioned in my uh, prior uh, comments. Uh, a, a large shift of capacity is going to be going from that six to eight inch where you're going to get more output with an already installed uh, uh, capex on the six inch as we convert it with a very uh, capex light you know it's purely a conversion we're not building new furnaces or new sites as you convert from six to eight you're going to get a boost in uh, uh, capacity just from the number of die uh, that's going to keep supporting our our growth and then follow that up with uh, uh, the Czech Republic investments, but we also do procure externally. Uh, we never said it was going to be 100% internal. We have an internal and external mix. Uh, the mix uh, will change as we uh, go over time based on our capex and our uh, internal expansion. And our eight inch internally has been uh, performing very well uh, already at 350 micron going into fab, which is basically best in class today. Uh, so we expect that to continue with the capex level that Thad mentioned. So very efficient, forward-looking expansion to support a revenue growth. So you're going to see a lot of it going to the bottom line. Great, thank you. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Chris Danelli of City. Your line is open. Hey guys, I think that's me, Chris Danley. Um, Maybe I should put on my uh, Sopranos accent again. Hey, a couple longer-term questions. Um, so, Thad, you mentioned that CapEx is peaking and going down. Can you just talk about, like, depreciation for uh, 25 versus 24 and then what you expect depreciation to do for the next several years as it, uh, as it tails off? Yeah, it's really consistent with where we are today. Um, you know, if, if you think about what we're bringing on and what we've what we brought on in the last few years, it's already hitting the the P&L, right? Um, and then you've got some roll off uh, as we continue to bring on that capacity in, in the Czech Republic. So it's it's roughly in line to where it's going to be as we look into 25. I don't see it as a headwind. You know, it's it's roughly kind of in that seven percent uh, of revenue range, and I don't expect that changing for 25 or 26. Well, wouldn't depreciation go down with the lower capex? Yeah, yeah, eventually it will, right. Um, but you still got some capacity that's coming on this year, right? So I don't think that has it. But when you look out into into 26, yeah, it, it should start coming down. Okay, great. And then for my follow-up, um, another longer-term question on just uh, silicon carbide. So if the market is, if, if growth is slowing and the market's flattening out a little bit, what about all this um, 
this bridge inventory you guys have, is there any risk of like pricing or anything like that? Or how do, how do we get rid of that bridge inventory? And then where do we expect that to go over the next uh, four quarters? Yeah, so there, there's no concern pricing. We, when we talk about the bridge and the strategic inventory build on silicon carbide, we're talking about substrates only. Uh, so we can basically build it to whatever customer demand comes in. So we hold it in, uh, in purely in substrates. Uh, most of it not, doesn't even have epi in it, so voltage is not even uh, uh, defined yet. So it is at the most common denominator of our whole customer, whether it's auto or industrial. And launching from that is where we uh, uh, we create the finished goods. So there's no risk to obsolescence, no risk to pricing. We will build to demand based on uh, when we get it and based on the outlook. And that's why we don't we don't add value to that inventory and hold it anywhere closer to finished goods just to keep that uh, optionality. Thanks, Hassan. Very helpful. And one moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Blaine Curtis of Jeffries. Your line is open. Hey, thanks for taking my question. I just want to drill into the auto segment. I thought I heard you say that the growth sequentially in auto was driven by silicon carbide. I just want to kind of double click on the what you're seeing by geography. I mean, there's been this expectation that China is going to gain share in EVs. Can you just talk about what drove the, what geography drove that strength, and to the extent that China EVs do take share globally? Your positioning there. I thought you, you talked about 50% share, but those are in designs. If it happens now, I'm just kind of curious if that's good or bad for you. Yeah, so the, uh, the strength obviously for us uh, in auto and in silicon carbide uh, uh, was driven by uh, China and the share gains we've had in uh, China specifically. When I talk about design uh, uh, wins or the share base on design wins, you know, I refer also to my comment, I think, last quarter about the uh, Beijing Auto Show and the 800 volt kind of platforms that we're in, where it's, I would say it's, it's further from design win. It's actually in vehicles uh, today. So as these vehicles ramp, which they started now, and they will ramp into 25, that should start seeing uh, uh, extended strength. But we did see the strength in, uh, in China, both from a total market and our penetration in that market with the designs that we already have. We expect that to continue in 25. Thanks. And, and I'm just curious, you mentioned the data center. Um, can you just wrap some maybe timing uh, around that in terms of when you could see kind of first revenue? And in terms of, you said you've been working on it for a long time here. You know, what's the right time frame to think about getting design wins for them? Yeah, so look, we already or, already have design wins. We're, uh, we already have revenue in, uh, in that segment. Obviously, it's, uh, it's early time revenue, but there is revenue. Uh, the products that we have uh, launched now, you expect revenue in 2025 as uh, uh, products get qualified and the customers ramp. Uh, for example, you know we did the, we announced the T10 uh, trench fed last quarter. We already have design uh, uh, wins on that being qualified at the hyperscaler. So uh, we expect revenue from these products that I talked about in 2025, but we already have product uh, or revenue on existing products already this year. So we're in the markets, we're working on new platform, we're working on new designs, and with our new product uh, introduction, that's really going to boost the portfolio that we are able to offer customers. Thanks, Hassan. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Quinn Bolton of Needham & Company. Your line is open. Hey, Son, I just wanted to follow up on the, the AI data center uh, wins that you just mentioned. I think you said you had wins at three of the four hyperscalers for multi-phase controllers and uh, individual voltage regs. I just want to, one, clarify, and two, if that's the case, is that more for CPU power or does it also include GPU or AI accelerator? And then i got to follow up. Yeah, we didn't, we, we're not specifying exactly which product specifically, I rattled off the portfolio because when you go into an account and we target the power tree, you need to be able to show coherent or cohesive uh, uh, power distribution from the beginning to the end. That's why we started with SIC with the uh, uh, PSU all the way to the, the cores. Uh, that really is, is the general approach that we have, uh, both for the NVIDIA and the ARM. 
Got it. And then for uh, that, I think East Fishkill was expected to be about 100 basis point headwind of margins, Q3, Q4, and then sort of taper off into next year. Just want to make sure that's still the right way to think about the East Fishkill overhang. Yeah, that's correct. It's still about 100 basis points dilutive to the, the corporate uh, gross margin. will continue to be that way in Q4. When we look into 25, it'll be, you know, you can think about it as being fairly linear in terms of improvement, you know, and by the end of the year, most of that uh, 100 basis points will be will be off the company at that point uh, as we exited that, uh, that business for global foundries. Perfect. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Josh Buckhalter of TD Cohen. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, good morning. Sorry for belaboring silicon carbide, but you're probably used to it by now. Um, I, I wanted to sort of ask about the guidance for low single-digit growth again. Can you um, – it was helpful walking through some of the auto versus non-auto and then commentary on your lead customer uh, can you give us any details on what each of those buckets are growing? Because I'm trying to reconcile the ongoing share gains in China with what looks like a stabilized um, outlook at your lead customer with, with the low single-digit growth. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, we're, look, we're, we're not uh, breaking out growth by industrial and, and, and auto uh, in general. We talked about the diversification as we get more and more of uh, uh, designs, both regional diversification and within a customer diversification as we get into more platforms within the customer to offset the lumpiness that, that you see model to model. Uh, North America uh, is up for us, uh, and that's based on commentary I made before, uh, both on ramp and share gain. I will leave the uh, guide and outlook to our customers' uh, earnings and our customers' commentary. But for North America for us uh, was up, uh, China was up. Uh, so you can see everything was, was up as expected, just not at the level that uh, we expected it for the second half of the year due to end demand, which is very well publicized by the OEMs uh, themselves. But being up regionally gives you a little indication of where the shares are as far as design wins and ramp and the penetration within these accounts. Got it. Thank you. And, and following up kind of on that, um, one of your large peers uh, talked about their China auto business up 20% sequentially this quarter. Uh, I'm guessing you won't give us a metric there, but maybe you could talk about what you're seeing in that um, in that vertical specifically, because you know since the earnings, we've gotten a little bit of concern that there might be some pull-in or, or, or idiosyncrasies going on with that market. So I'd be curious to hear you expand on what you're seeing in the China auto market a bit. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I, I know who you're referring to, because I think there's only one that did earnings already. Uh, so we're we're not in the, the same uh, buckets. For us, electrification, when I refer to electrification, is really the drivetrain. Uh, uh, which is where silicon carbide plays, uh, not necessarily in in, uh, in general. So it may be a mix uh, thing only, uh, which is a discrepancy. But our China business did grow uh, as well. We're not breaking out uh, regionally regional growth from the overall growth, but China did grow in automotive, and it grows specifically with the strength in EVs driven by silicon carbide. Thanks, Hassan. One moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Christopher Rowland of Susquehanna. Your line is open. Hey, thanks for the question. Uh, I guess my first is, can you break down automotive geographically for us just into some larger buckets between, you know, Europe, uh, Japan, and, and China for us? So I'm trying to think, you know, the... Well, China, China's strong. I think it's China's strong, strong. yeah. Uh, you know, it's not just walking. No, 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 no. I mean, just as a percent, as a percent of revenue, sorry. No, we, uh, we're not breaking down markets by regional percentages. We're... Because there's a lot okay. of it. it. Does it ship through or, or uh, and leave the country? Is it the, it's, it's, it gets too lumpy and too confusing. So uh, we look at it as a market by region indication whether was it up or, or uh, 
how it behaves, just to give you a strength of where the strength is coming from as we get through this uh, uh, L shape. Okay, I, I was just talking kind of larger percentages, uh, roughly, but it, if, if you can't provide that, that's okay. Um, I guess for my second question, um, you know, guys like TI are going back to consumer customers, broader markets. It sounds like, you know, with, with your distribution comments, um, you might be a little more warm to these markets. I'm not sure. Um, but could you talk about how you're approaching that that other bucket? Sounds yeah, like uh, uh, I, I, price, but are you a little more open? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't talk about you know open to consumer market or not. You know, our focus is value. When we put the uh, you know when we I talk about the mass market and uh, uh, like that said, seeding that market with distribution inventory because it has to be on the shelf for us to uh, uh, to ship, we're not looking at it's for this market or that market. We look at it as a mass market. Any customer can uh, buy those products as long as you know the margin is uh, provided on the value that those products provide. But I will be very, very clear on the call. Our strategy of chasing other markets at the expense of margin just to get top line or utilization is not and no longer part of our strategy. So we're not going to get into this trap of let's go, you know, maybe squint a little bit on pricing to get what we need on utilization and uh, revenue. We're actually focusing on value. We are not going to dilute our value and we will maintain the product value, whether it's going through mass market or not. Thank you, Ms. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Vijay Rakesh of Mizuho. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for uh, uh, letting me ask you a question. Hassan and Thad, um, just a quick question on the inventory side. Uh, when you look at DST and OEM inventory, uh, can you talk to where those levels should be exhibiting, let's say December versus what normal levels are? And then I follow up. Yeah, hey, look, on the, the DST side, um, you know, I said it in my prepared remarks, we expect the, the weeks of inventory and DISD to increase slightly, you know, 10 weeks plus or minus, um, you know, as we focus on that mass market. Um, when you talk about in customers, like that's that's really hard to, hard for us to monitor, right? Um, you know, there's yeah. definitely inventory out there. We think the inventory digestion is ongoing. Um, but, you know, a lot of that is going to depend on in demand. If in demand picks up, that inventory burns through quicker. Yeah, one thing, one thing just to be, uh, is, is it's not an industry uh, commentary either. You know, you have some customers that have low, very low inventory. We're talking about a couple of weeks. And then you have others that have much longer, invent, much uh, uh, larger inventory that they're trying to bring down. So it's not an industry commentary where we can say it's, you know, inventory is everywhere. And that's more related to, if you look at the tier one and you listen to their earnings, they're stating their inventory position and what they're trying to get it to. The OEMs have finished good inventory. That's also very well publicized. From our side, we're able to triangulate a lot of that. And obviously, we're into the accounts with the OEMs directly trying to get the, uh, the end demand. So that's why it's, I wouldn't say as a, it's a industry-wide. Uh, it's a customer by customer. So it's hard to say, you know, how many weeks do we believe or how long does it take to drain? Got it. Uh, and one last question. Uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, good to hear this, a 200 meter silicon carbide is ramping well, but as you, let's say, looking out, exiting 2025, let's say, what would be a mix of internal 200 millimeter silicon carbide? Uh, well, we are actually driving to about a 80 20 or 70 30. Uh, even if we are able to do more internally, we are managing the mix because we would like to always have a external uh, uh, feed into our factories just to keep the uh, the lines and really the quality baseline uh, uh, fresh across all sources. So we don't expect that uh, uh, outlook to change. But it's a 70, 70 internal or? Internal. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Tor Svanberg of Stiefel. Your line is open. 
Yes, um, uh, thank you. Uh, Hassan, I had a question on the um, share gain in China EV for 800 volt. I think last quarter, I think you said approaching 60%. I think now you said 50%. Is, is that just a technicality or, or did something change uh, quarter over quarter? No, not, nothing changed. Nothing changed. It's, uh, it's the same, same design wins, same everything. As you ramp, you're going to start, well, as you ramp actual design, you're going to start getting that the uptick from it. Perfect. Just want to clarify that. Uh, second yeah. question is on the mass the mass market and the staging of in inventory. So uh, how how far will you go? Is ten weeks sort of the highest uh, we should expect in the next few quarters, uh, or will, would it go beyond that as you continue that staging? Yeah. Look, I, I think our new target range, as we think about kind of a normalized market, is a nine nine to eleven weeks. Right, so that 10, 10 weeks plus or minus is right in the sweet spot, but uh, I don't think you're going to see us go north of, of 11. Great, thank you, Ted. One moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Chris Casso of Wolf Research. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, the first question is on uh, the capital intensity that you, you mentioned. Um, uh, moving lower, uh, you know, I, I guess, I, is there anything structural in that that we should be contemplating, uh, or, or is this just a function of, of where utilization is right now and, and the fact that, uh, you know, you can grow revenue into the existing capacity? And perhaps, you know, with that, you know, given where the utilization levels are right now, is there a particular, you know, sort of revenue capacity that you could grow into without uh, increasing the CapEx very much? Yeah, Chris, it's Thad. So, Look, we've made big investments over the last several years. Those investments went primarily to silicon carbide and EFK, right? So both of those um, investments are now behind us. We do have more in silicon carbide as, as we go forward. Think about that Czech Republic investment, but that's over a multi-year period. So I wouldn't look at this structural. I would look at this as uh, achieving that, that target early, and it's based on the performance of our manufacturing footprint. I've said this many times. We continue to, to optimize that footprint. Um, and, and drive cost out and drive efficiency up, which gets more units out. And, you know, obviously at 65% utilized, we have a lot of capacity. So there isn't a need to bring capacity on other than for the strategic nature of, of silicon carbide. The rest of this will be primarily maintenance. And, and I wouldn't, yeah, and I wouldn't think about, you know, our CapEx level as uh, uh, hindering any growth, uh, future growth at all. As I mentioned in my prior uh, uh, answer, silicon carbide, volume or capacity is going to grow just by very low capex conversion from six to eight will give you a boost in capacity you know our analog uh, mixed signal new products will be landing in uh, east fishkill which is again a new fab that's going to support the growth so we're very comfortable with where our footprint is and we'll continue to look at optimizing our brownfield investment got it thank you um I guess as a follow-up, I'll ask you another question on silicon carbide. And, you know, interested in your view on, you know, where this market goes into next year. And I recognize that, um, you know, where, where volume goes is, is, is a tough question at this point. But, you know, the other part of silicon carbide is, is, is penetration because silicon carbide, um, you know, the penetration rate is still relatively low. And you've got some visibility there on design wins. So I, I guess the first part of the question is, you know, where do you think you can grow this business next year? And then secondly, you know, how much uh, of that growth, potential growth, you know, comes from, from penetration versus just EV units? Yeah, uh, look, in general, I, I agree with the, with the statement that our view or long-term view of silicon carbide or electrification market remains unchanged. You know, that was what, what we started the call with, with Ross's question of uh, uh, does that cause us to change any of our outlook? The answer is no, because of exactly the two points you brought up. EVs are going to continue to grow. You know, the, the rate of growth year on year will be lumpy, but it is still growth. And then you have, on top of that, you got silicon carbide penetration within the EVs. As you mentioned, today, we're only, if I take out the market, uh, North America market leader, we're about 6% as an industry, silicon carbide penetrated into uh, uh, EVs. If you refer to my comments last quarter about the Beijing Auto Show, uh, most, if not all, of the new model that were introduced specifically in China 
were 800 volt uh, driven with silicon carbide. So that penetration of silicon carbide into EV will continue to grow into 2025. And then the market will define how much of the unit volume of EVs will grow into 25. For us, we expect silicon carbide to also grow in 2025, given those two uh, 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 trends that I mentioned. Got it. Thank you. In one moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Jed Dorsheimer of William Blair. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question and putting me in. Um, I guess first question, Hassan, um, I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on the value proposition that your customers are um, asking you about in the PowerTree uh, data center specifically. Do you see it, how does that relate to the efficiency and the shift to modules in EVs and um, you know, what gives you confidence that silicon carbide versus gallium nitride is going to be the, the solution there? And then I have a follow-up. Okay, there's just a couple of things and I will try to reiterate just to make sure I get the, the question and I give you the right answer. So from the AI in general, uh, the power tree is efficiency. You know, you can have the most efficient conversion at the GPU, and then you can lose most of it from, call it the, uh, uh, the PSU all the way in. So efficiency of the power tree is important. That's becoming more and more important, not to the module or the, the server maker, but more for the hyperscaler. 1% efficiency loss on a power tree. Think about that loss on a rack. Think about that utility bill that they would otherwise not be getting by getting the 1% efficiency. That's the, uh, 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 the benefit that we're seeing. Your next question is about silicon carbide versus GAN. Uh, those are two different things. Silicon carbide, when we talk about silicon carbide and the, the product that we announced last quarter at 650 volts, that's more closer to the grid in the power tree. If I think the power tree grid all the way to GPU, that's more in the PSU, high voltage PSU conversion. As you get closer, you get silicon and uh, uh, GAN as you get closer, higher frequency, lower voltage, where you want the efficiency. That's where, for example, uh, you have silicon products that are as efficient, uh, which are T10 trench fat, and that's what's gaining uh, uh, wind. So it's not about silicon carbide versus GAN versus silicon. It's really a different branches in that power tree is where the most optimal technology needs to fit. And our ability to provide all of these give us that portfolio and that competitive advantage of the customer. So that's how we look at it. And by the way, it's, uh, to your comment on electrification or EVs, same concept in EVs. There's, we still have IGBT, we have silicon carbide, and we have hybrid, uh, where you don't need 100% SIC or 100% IGBT. We look at the power tree and automotive the same way, where we focus on providing the best efficiency with the most optimized you know, performance to cost uh, benefit for the customer. The same formula is uh, getting us into the uh, uh, power tree for uh, AI. Got it. That's helpful. I'll jump back in queue. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Harsh Kumar of Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Yeah, hey guys, thanks for squeezing me in. Um, fellows, good job controlling what you can control in this tough environment. Pat, I had one for you. Um, your guiding revenue is sort of flattish. Uh, should I assume the mix between the two key end markets, automotive and industrial, to be kind of the same flattish, just basically what it was last quarter, or is there some puts and takes that I can think about? No, we think uh, automotive is going to be up, you know, lid low to mid single digits. Um, just with the silicon carbide continuing to ramp. Um, industrial is kind of flattish, you know, maybe slightly down. The other bucket will, will likely be down, but uh, we think auto will, will outgrow the overall total. Great. Thank you for that color. And then maybe one for um, Hassan. Hassan, um, when you talk to, uh, I'm curious, want to get some visibility on what kind of conversations you have with your customers. It seems like there's excess inventory, seems like there's lackluster end demand, seems like it's both. 
So when you talk to your customers, when do they envision a turn to happen or they simply don't know? And is interest rate a factor here at all as it starts to kick in into the econ economy? And then my last part of the question separate was, um, one of your competitors got basically a lot of chip back money, uh, much more than I would have thought. Um, I was curious if where you guys stand in that, uh, in, in that spectrum. Sure. Uh, so first on the uh, dialogue with the customers. Uh, look, the, the conversation with the customer, nobody's got a better crystal ball than, than the other. So the conversation with customers is really around how are we both going to get ready for a uh, recovery in demand? And if the recovery is, uh, it happens quickly, how are we going to be ready versus you know, 2021, for example, where the shortages happen? That's the strategic dialogue of visibility, of communication, and really the tightness of the relationship that, that really uh, is important here. Uh, you know, I was in, in uh, Europe, for example, last uh, week where the dialogue was, I would say, 50% about that. The other 50% is new designs. Uh, so the design in activity at the OEMs, uh, driven by the OEMs into the Tier 1, also has not uh, uh, slowed down, which tells you that nobody's taking this as a change in a, a long-term strategy, uh, uh, you know, electrification and, and so on. So everybody remains committed to their plans. Everybody acknowledges that there's lumpiness in demand. It could be helped by uh, uh, interest rates, absolutely, uh, because it's consumer confidence and consumer spend. But when is it going to play its way through the economy? That's the, the knee in the curve that we're uh, waiting. But what we can do now is making sure we're ready. You know, we talked about strategic inventory builds on the silicon carbides for us to react quicker, et cetera. These are things we can do along with our customers to be ready. As far as, uh, you know, chips uh, money, I won't comment on, uh, uh, you know, where, where we are specifically. We've always said we're going to do what we need to do for us as a company, and the support from the CHIPS Act is, is uh, very welcome to offset some of the investment we have to make in North America. We're not going after it just to build new fabs and build new capacity that we otherwise will not need, uh, because you may get funding, but you'll pay for it on the, on the back end once you have the building running. We're not going to be going down that path. You heard that about our investments and our CapEx and our new model. We're going to work within these parameters. As far as what, the, uh, what I would call the preliminary terms that one of our uh, competitors got, you know, I wish him luck. Uh, I think the struggles were not related to funding. The struggles were related to operational, but I wish him luck. Fair enough. So, uh, thanks, Hassan. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Parag. And this concludes our Q&A session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Hassan el Khoury, President and CEO, for closing remarks. Uh, thank you for joining us on the call this morning. And uh, I want to thank all our employees for pushing through this prolonged period of uncertainty. We'll continue to navigate the market environment and deliver value to our stakeholders by focusing on our execution and operational excellence. Thank you. And this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.